This is a reflection for the readings on Friday of the seventh week of Easter. The first reading is taken from Acts chapter 24, verse 27, and 25, verses 13 to 21. The responsorial psalm is taken from Psalm 103, and the gospel is from John chapter 21, verses 15 to 19. Today's gospel must be understood in its proper context. Peter, back in Matthew chapter 16, gave the right answer to Jesus' question, Who do people say that I am? But to reply that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is not enough. Intellectual knowledge of Christ's identity is only the beginning, because even the demons acknowledge as much. Such truth must travel the great distance from the head to the heart, where it becomes love. Thus, when Peter is asked this time from a mere slave girl whether he knows Jesus, Peter makes the great reversal. Instead of identifying Jesus as God in the flesh, the great I am, Peter replies to the question whether Jesus is his friend, I am not. Such a moral collapse exposes Peter's insufficient formation, but instead of despairing, as Judas did, Peter humbles himself in tears. This is the setting for today's Gospel, in which Jesus now asks the deeper question of Peter, not do you know me, but do you love me? This question is repeated three times to undo the three earlier denials, thereby restoring Peter's dignity as a person and disciple. But as I mentioned, Jesus is not content with mere restoration. He uses his friend's failure to actually deepen Peter's love. It doesn't quite come out in the English translation of our gospel, but it does in the original language. Two different Greek words are used for love in the passage. The first is the highest form of love, a self-sacrificial giving rooted in the will. This is agape love. The second is a more shallow form of friendship based on feeling. The closest English equivalent is the formal distinction between love and like. So the dialogue actually goes like this. Jesus begins by asking Peter if he truly loves him in the highest sense. But Peter, aware of his recent betrayal, cannot bring himself to use that word, but rather says, You know that I like you. Jesus repeats the question a second time, Peter, do you love me? Again, using the highest form of love, agape. Again, Peter replies with the word like. The third time, Jesus turns the tables on Peter. He downgrades the challenge by using Peter's own term for friendship, asking, Are you even my friend? Peter, we are told, is hurt by this question, and although he is still only able to respond using the word like, it does cause Peter to admit a deep friendship with Jesus that will grow into a true sacrificial love. Jesus confirms this in the very next verse, by telling Peter that a time is coming when he will stretch out his hands and be led to a place that he would rather not be, indicating the kind of death Peter would endure for love of his Lord. For Peter, it begins early in the book of Acts, where he fearlessly preaches the risen Christ in the face of great opposition from the rulers who threaten him. He disobeys the civil authorities of his day and rejoices that he is worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of Christ, and in fact, he will go to his death as a martyr and saint. What Jesus did for Peter, he deeply desires to do for us. When we sin, Jesus wants more than anything else to restore us. As children of God, restore the life of grace in our souls and the love for God and others whom we fail, including ourselves. But not just to restore, but actually deepen our love, to bring good out of evil, so that we utterly surrender to God and depend on Him totally. That's what the saints did. After all, saints are simply repentant sinners who turn to God. We often think that saints are the opposite of sinners, but there are no opposite of sinners in this world. There are only saved sinners and unsaved sinners. It is a fellowship of amazed sinners who have come to the end of themselves. That is why, the saints sing in heaven, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. They know that they are in heaven only by the grace of God 
and by Jesus patiently restoring them following their many failures. If we look back on Peter's life, it wasn't just his betrayal of Jesus on Holy Thursday. There were plenty of failures before that. Jesus had given him permission to walk on water, and yet at the first sign of wind and waves he loses faith and begins to sink. Then there is the time that Peter actually rebukes Jesus for wanting to endure his passion. Then he wants to remain on the Mount of Transfiguration. Then childlessly wants to know how often to forgive sinners. And at the Last Supper, he didn't want Jesus to wash his feet. He sleeps in the Garden of Gethsemane and then impulsively cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. The list of mistakes is quite impressive. Yet Jesus forgives and restores him to a position of leadership. So the lesson is clear. When we fail, even if miserably and often, we must never despair or lose hope. This was the mistake of Judas. Jesus would have restored him too, had he repented. Jesus wants to make saints out of sinners. Jesus wants to make us saints. And the only way is by using our failures and sins to show us his mercy and how much we really need him. As the first beatitude says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The thief on the cross who appealed to Jesus knew this truth. May we also know it deep in our hearts and make it our path to holiness and heaven. Let us pray. O God, who by the glorification of your Christ and the light of the Holy Spirit have unlocked for us the gates of eternity, Grant, we pray, that partaking of so great a gift, our devotion may grow deeper and our faith be strengthened. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.